nation. Come on, South Africa. We declare. We take the land. We sit on the gates. We take them right now. The sons of God are arising for such a time as this. We take those gates for the kingdom mandate, for the kingdom agenda. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Come on, begin to declare. Begin to declare. We are taking the gates. We are entering the gates. We are sitting on
South Africa will never accomplish that by herself. There are initiating nations that God has released out there to begin to provoke revival. Nigeria is one of them, South Africa. Nigeria is one of them. So we need to learn to receive people, not hallelujah, but looking with spiritual eyes. The redemptive purpose of South Africa and Nigeria is closely tied like this. Uh, okay, I'm going to preach to these. They say amen. These ones, they don't understand. Lord, give them revelation. Give them understanding. Hear me well, South Africa. South Africa's redemptive purpose for the continent is closely tied to that of Nigeria. So don't do anything. Don't do anything in the spiritual realm to begin to, you know, play with God's redemptive purpose for, for Africa. This is not your nation, South Africa. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it thereof. It means that this nation belongs to God. And anybody who is a son of God has the right to come in here. God is looking for sons of God in this season who will manage and steward their father's estate. So we're here to talk about gates. Gates, you can never talk about gates without talking about righteousness. In this era, righteousness. Righteousness. We've got a team of young lady lawyers who are called the Deborahs. They, they work in justice issue. Because did you know that there were gates of justice? Amos 5, 15 and 24 talks about gates. Justice being, being dispensed at the gates. At the gates. Ah, Africa, justice will be dispensed on your behalf in this season. Restoration, restitution, everything that, that is due to Africa in this season. Justice for Africa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as I was praying, the Lord said, continue on the aspect of gates. And today as we were talking with Apostle, you know, and we were talking and we were even planning for the next meetings. <laughs> Hallelujah. Follow-up meetings. Would, would you be interested in follow-up meetings? <laughs> for next year. Talking, this is just an introduction to provoke you. Yeah. No, so the Lord said, um, you know, he was coming, and the Lord said, actually, call the apostle and, and see if he can bring come to bring out new dimensions of gates, new dimensions of gates, new understanding of gates. So that you and I will take our rightful position in South Africa. That the agenda of the enemy will not begin to prevail. But that we will begin to sit on those gates with understanding. With understanding and in line with kingdom purpose and kingdom mandate. Hallelujah. Before he comes up, I'm just going to ask the worship team just to welcome him with that song, Kadosh. Can we sing that song, Kadosh? Kadosh, Kadosh, let's welcome the man of God. Come on, let's just lift up our hands and worship. Maya Brosekete. I want to thank every man and woman of God who has come here. I know that we have over, we have over, uh, it's, it's more than two, three hundred ministers of the gospel here. Many, many more. That's why, I mean, this whole, I think the first four or five rows at least, they're all people who are very close to me. They're all pastors. They're all apostles, evangelists. So excuse me for not mentioning your name today. You know I still have love. I still have love for you. <laughs> so, but uh, if I mention somebody, then somebody's going to send me to jail tomorrow or try to. So we bless you. And some have come as far as Cape Town. Some have flown in. We have a whole group from the United States of America over there behind me. There's USA in the house. Hallelujah. We have people coming in from the different nations coming to, to, to Botswana is here. Botswana is in the house. Hallelujah. Whoa. Amen. Amen. So there are different nations that are represented here. There are, are many, many ministers of the gospel here. But when we leave from here, it's not to just leave with excitement, it's to leave with purpose. It's to leave with purpose.
to leave with understanding, to leave with conviction, to leave understanding that there is a window of opportunity. With prophetic things, there are windows of opportunity. And if we don't take this window of opportunity, it may never come back again. We must be serious, Bazalwan. We must be serious when we leave from here. This is not just another meeting. God is going to use his vessel. He's going to use his channel to begin to position us so that as South Africans, as citizens of this continent, we will be able, we will be able to position ourselves to use up this window, this window of opportunity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They're just going to minister and... Um, Apostle will come on as soon as he's ready to come on. But I want you, I, 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 I really don't think there's any point in ministering, I mean, or, or sharing who he is. I think we all, do we know him? <laughs> we know him in the spiritual realm. We know that God has been using him very much in the apostolic, in the prophetic. And the apostolic and prophetic is very much about alignment, is very much about understanding kingdom patterns, bringing alignment. Hallelujah. We know that God has not given him a spirit of fear. That he's used him to confront some very sensitive issues, some very sensitive things. May the Lord continue to use him even more. Even more in that area. In terms of doctrine and God taking him to the nations. So we want to thank God for his life. We want to bless God for his life. Remain in prayer for him. And um, we just bless God. We just bless God. GMC, are you in the house? We thank God for you and for your life. So we're going to welcome Apostle. I want you, I know as, as South Africans, we're not very used to staying long. We like these snackenyanas, 30 minutes in yana, ne? Yeah. Fandach is Fandach. <laughs> fandach is Fandach. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to 30 minutes. No 30 minutes. Niggas, not even not one hour. Huh? You didn't travel all the way to Cape Town for 30 minutes. Huh? Not even one hour. Two hours, three hours, however long it takes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Today we're coming to hear the word of the Lord. Today we're coming to be released and provoked into kingdom destiny. We shall be like polished arrows in the hands of the mighty warrior. And God will release us and we will not miss our targets. So today, today we're going to sit and we're going to hear the word of the Lord. And until apostle releases us, nobody's going to look at their watch. Niggas, niggas. You didn't queue up there in that traffic line for 30 minutes to come and look at your watch. Hey, it's 9 o'clock. Hey, I wanna taba, I wanna taba. Even if 10 o'clock, even if 11 o'clock, even if 12 o'clock, even if 1 a.m., even if 2 a.m., even if 3 a.m., Simunye, we are one. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to hand over to the worship team. The next person you will see then is Apostle who will come. Hallelujah. Come on, welcome the worship team. This is my daughter. This is Pastor Edgar's daughter. Teach and train your children when they're young so that they know the ways to go. Hallelujah.
we give thanks to God for this opportunity he has granted us to contemplate on his present revelation position tonight. Uh, as we progress in this meeting, it might be difficult for you to say amen at some point. That's why I want us to say amen now, just for free. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Edgar. He might be Edgar Bright. Pastor Edgar, thank you, Dr. Terry. My sister. Indeed. Yes, she's my sister. We had, uh, we had a moment this afternoon and uh, the connection was so powerful. And I asked her, why are we just meeting now? Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lord, we ask that you bring your counsel to us and cause the voice of your heart to rest upon the church on the continent of Africa. No part of us, functionaries that have capacity in the Holy Ghost, to do things that humankind is not modified to be able to accomplish. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. God bless you. Is it possible for you to find gentle strings, the string sound, very gentle one, and then you play something uh, 25 minutes into my teaching. So we will we'll do Bible study for 40 minutes. Then we will pray for 15 minutes. The only thing that may elongate our stay is if the Holy Ghost decides to join with the prayer. And it will not be my doing that we stay till 12 midnight or 2 a.m. just like doctor said. And it will be the Holy Spirit's doing. Amen. All right. Turn your Bible with me since we are a company of church leaders, pastors, apostles, and prophets. We will attempt to strike the chord and to find the sound on the heart of God for the church on the continent of Africa. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. We'll read from verse 25 and verse number 26. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made many widows in their midst. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane Neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am prof profaned among them. Now, this is God's quarrel. God, God has, can you, it's supposed to be like, not audible, just the line between not audible and audible. Please, 
Amen. Stay with me. And join me in 25 minutes, not now. Okay, I think we'll do without you for now. But maybe subsequently. Have you ever read scriptures in which you find that God is in contention with the priesthood? God is in contention with his people. God is in contention with a generation. If you read those verses of scripture, you need to read them with gravity in order for us to find out the reasons for which God was protesting and to ensure that you're not in the category that is revealed in the protest that God makes. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 22, there is a concern that God brings into the lamplight, and the concern is that at some point, because of the texture of the service delivery called ministry, it was almost impossible to discern between that which was holy and that which was profane. That means there was a mixture If God gives me utterance, I will attempt to show us the reason for which our strength as a body on the continent is depleted. And until we recover from this deficit, we will not have the much needed spiritual masculinity to take the gates. Uh, the Bible says God had a quarrel and uh, the demarcation between holy and profane did, did not exist in the shape of ministry that was carried out in those days. It, it is for this reason that I may need to take us to the book of Revelation. Stay with me, stay with me. Because in Revelation chapter 17 and in Revelation chapter 21, God begins to speak using metaphors. And the metaphors that he speaks about is about two women. And these women represent civilizations. And it happens to be that these women are, are irreconcilable. Stay with me. Can we do Genesis, Revelation chapter 17? Oh my God, the reading will be too long. And I'm trying to ensure that it will be the Holy Spirit that will be responsible for. <laughs> yes, I don't want to be the one responsible. In the book of Revelation chapter 17, you can write it down from verse 1 to verse 5, we see. Babylon, the hallowed. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we see the new Jerusalem. And the Bible says it is adorned like a bride for her husband. So there are two women that we see in Scripture, and this is a deep prophetic metaphor. It happens to be that these two women are irreconcilable, therefore revealing the impossibility of having a system that can mix holy and profane at the same time. Are you still with me? All right, I would like you to draw a chart. We'll put um, Babylon here. We'll put the New Jerusalem here. And then we'll do some analysis, we'll try to interpret some things, and then we'll be able to use the lens of scripture to see the church on the continent of Africa. Because after the fall, there were only three families that God had to work with. The first family was the family of Shem. Then 
Ham, then Japheth. If you go to the book of Matthew and you see the legalities behind the crucifixion of Jesus, you will find out that the sons of Shem, representative of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, had condemned Jesus to death, not by a quotation from the Torah, but by a doctrine of necessity. Is it not better for one man to die than for a whole nation? They didn't draw that out of the Torah. It was just a doctrine of necessity that they had to lay hold on. That means the justice that led to the condemnation of Jesus Christ in the Sanhedrin was not a function of the counsel of God. It was a doctrine of necessity that came from man. Now, and that's, that, that's, that was done by the sons of, Jap of, of Shem. Pilate happens to be a son of Japheth, and when Jesus was brought to Pilate for him to sentence Jesus according to Roman law, uh, it happens to be that the grand norm of that society was Roman law because Israel was not a self-governing nation. He puts aside the grand norm and he based his judgment on an ancient tradition. It was not on the constitution of the, of the Roman Empire that justice emerged from. It came from a tradition. Are you still following me? So, the sons of Shem sentenced him to death. The son of Japheth sentenced him to death. It happens to be that is only, in fact, are you there? If we continue on that trajectory, you will find out that the meaning of resurrection is that the court of heaven, God, who is the judge of all, had to now look into the case because the Sanhedrin had sentenced him to death without any recourse to the Torah. Pilate has sentenced him to, to death without consulting the Constitution. So the court of heaven had to sit and ruled on the matter. And the ruling of the court of heaven was resurrection. Are you with me? Now, I just wanted to take it on that tangent, but that's not where I'm going. Only one tribe was left, the sons of Ham, the Africans. Or the, yeah, the African people. Because Simon the Cyrenian, who eventually helped Jesus to take the cross to Golgotha, because if Jesus was fulfilling the type of the scapegoat, he had to die outside of the walls of Jerusalem. If he had died inside of Jerusalem, our redemption would be forfeit. At the time that Jesus fell, the Seventh, the fourth time, the fifth time, it became clear that he did not have physical strength to take the cross outside of the city. That was a day when heaven prayed and waited for it to answer. Because God was in a strait. Are you still with me? He couldn't use the son of Shem to accomplish what had to be accomplished because the son of Shem has already exercised his right and he condemned Jesus. Couldn't use the son of Japheth, condemned Jesus. And I'm, I'm wondering what Simon the Cyrenian was doing in that vicinity. Because Cyrene, that's ancient day Libya. What is a Libyan doing? Okay, it's very difficult to put all of that together. <laughs> but that was the man that God manipulated into the entire equation that took the cross of Jesus Christ outside of the walls of Jerusalem in order to satisfy the claims of divine justice. Putting Africa in a tight prophetic spot that in the end of the age, Africa would need to bear witness concerning Jesus Christ such weakness that doesn't deny the weight of the cross. So in view of the above, that's the reason 
why we need to hold meetings like this. It's not every time redemption comes when you shout. Sometimes we need to contemplate deeply and take decisions that will shape our lives forever. If you are still with me, say amen. Amen. All right, so let's go back to our Bible study. And what we are contrasting and comparing is Revelation 17, 1 to 5, with Revelation 21, 1 to 10. And like I said, because of time, I will not read all those verses of Scripture. But we'll just do the analysis. Um, 17 speaks about a woman on a scarlet colored beast, and when she was identified, she was called Babylon the Great. And the Bible speaks of a city, a civilization that came down from the heavenlies, and it was like a bride adorned unto her husband. So, put one, one column is Babylon, the other column is what? The New Jerusalem. The first identity of Babylon, if you read Revelation chapter 17, is that Babylon is a harlot. Babylon is into prostitution. Babylon has multiple devotions. That's the first description of Babylon. So if, for instance, I want to serve the living God, because it's predominant in Africa these days, someone wants to serve God, but he goes to a place in Nigeria called Limbe. He goes to a place, he goes to a place called Ijebode. Some of the most ancient altars that were raised to deities and sirens of, of oceans are in these locations. And if it is, no, not Limbe, Nimbe, Nimbe, you can verify it if you meet any Nigerian that knows his salt. If you go to Nimbe, you will be treated to an accommodation and you will stay for three days with a python. No, yes, yes, that's how, uh, are you following what I'm talking about? <laughs> I mean, a pastor wants to be successful in ministry, all right? So, because of his drive for success, especially that we preached prosperity without balance, we preached prosperity without purpose. So the sign that you are still in vogue is that you can get a big crowd. The sign that you are still in vogue is that you can ride the best car. So it points to a prosperity that lacks purpose as a sign that you are still in vogue. Because of this kind of gospel, the profane and the holy have a strange marriage. So he, he wants to do ministry, but he goes to Nembe. Are you, are you following what I'm talking about? Then he stays there with this python, and the python will be coiling around him. While they are doing the incantations without the incantations, calling the spirits, the sirens of the ocean, and all of that. And then at some point, the spirits will possess the serpent and spit into his eyes. It, there's a possibility that he may not make it. But if he does, he begins to, he becomes a seer by the power of the nation. Oh, you're not with me. We're, we're talking about harlotry. I just hope I'm not, I have not started troubling you because I have not actually started <laughs> troubling. <laughs> so he comes out a seer. 
And when he stands on stage, he can tell your name, he can tell where you're coming from. Excuse me, excuse me. That's not necessarily, even if you, have, if you have the gift of word of knowledge, for instance, and I can say what your name is, that's not necessarily prophetic ministry. I hope you know. That's not prophetic ministry. If your spiritual efforts do not have the capacity to give direction to the body of Christ and to unveil God's present revelation position, you don't have a prophetic ministry, even if you can, can call everybody's name. Now, we need, we need education in this season to be able to decipher and to label the things that we call God that have no roots in the Bible. So we have seen over the years, because we do not have strong apostolic balance in our operations, we have accommodated halotry. And so many people patronize the power of darkness to do the work of God. I don't know, I don't want to, let me trouble you, let me trouble you. I don't know if there's anybody in this hall that made a, a, a pilgrimage trip to Nigeria to consult with a personality that claimed that he was born again from his mother's womb. Yes, yes, he was born again from his, do, you are not with me, you are not following me. I know you like your excitement, you like shouting. The estate of our father is in trouble. And the heritage of God in our land is about to be lost completely. This man never even lied to say, okay, I gave my life to Christ on this crusade when Reinhard Bonke came. He didn't even lie. He said he was born again from his mother's womb and he held that position until he died. He became, that man became the tourism industry in Nigeria. That man became <laughs> the reason for which 70% of the tourists that came to Nigeria came. They came because of a man that said he was born again from his mother's womb. Is that really, is that really ignorance? Are you sure? It is not. Because the average Christian knows that that is not applicable. But the average Christian doesn't mind romancing with the power. If he has the ability to cause changes, then I want to meet with him because I've been in this condition for 25 years and I've been praying and nothing came true. I need power. So we have a desperation that is not tampered with the knowledge that is revealed in scripture. We have accommodated halotry. There is no way we can contend with the gates and overwhelm the personalities that man them if we are guilty of halotry. Because when we talk about gates, we are talking about authorities. When we talk about windows, we are talking about blessings. When we talk about doors, we are talking about opportunities. It was Paul that said that a great door and an effectual is open unto me, an opportunity is open unto me, but there are many adversaries. So when we talk about gates, we are talking about authorities. The reason for which our nations sustain the current civilization that describes them, it's because of the authorities uh, that have influence, spiritual authorities that have influence in the land. So now we also have spiritual authorities that have influence in the church apart from Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus 
could come to one of the churches and he was locked out so he had to knock with the hope that the door will be open. And I'm not trying to strip that, strip that scripture of his evangelical usage, but in actual fact, what it was was that the CEO of a company came to check on the branches of the company. And one of the branches had locked him out. They were running stuff without him and everything was going on well and everybody was happy. That's what happens when we allow for harlotry. My attempt tonight is to destroy that marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't be offended in this meeting. Go and listen to the tape again and find out what is talking. Be very sure. Before you become offended, find out what is talking. What, what is responsible for what this man is saying? If you can conclude that it's not God, then you can be offended. You'll be justified. Halotry. When the goal becomes gain, then we can confuse the gold head for the Godhead. So the average minister that is coming up in the labors of the gospel no longer believes that there are processes that you go through processes that God allows you to go through so that your pride can be damaged so that your ego can be pierced so that your high mindedness can be humbled and then you begin to look to God to strengthen you with might by his spirit in your inner man all he wants to do is to succeed and his definition of success is Relative to what society can acknowledge. So he's doing everything he's doing so that the next door neighbor would not say, he's failing. He's trying so hard. And he thinks that he's in the service of Jesus. It's halotry. A situation where you can accept an invitation from someone that is obvious because you cannot hide food. We don't know how people's hearts are. If the Holy Spirit, uh, walking through the gift of discernment of spirit, gives us perspective, we can, we can pick how people's hearts are without interfacing with them. But the Holy Spirit is not always moving. So we have other things to look at. One of the things Jesus recommended is for us to look at fruit. You, you can't fake fruit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So if you, if you look critically and you see the fruit, fruit in terms of the people that have been raised, how, who do they look like? Fruit in terms of character. Fruit in terms of his drive, his passion, his motivation. Because you always know if a businessman is the one preaching. <laughs> His God speaks through him. I don't want to, I don't want to trouble you now, but <laughs> well, well, just so that I will not be arrested outside of this place, I will stop. So Babylon is a halot, and for Babylon, anything goes. Yeah. Meanwhile, the New Jerusalem is a bride. Her devotion is to one. Her style may not be contemporary. Her strategy may not be modern. But the description that she sustains is a function of her devotion to another. She doesn't even have the liberty to choose 
anything. Because everything is according to the prescription of the bridegroom. So if we take the lens and put it on your ministry, and we look at your ministry in detail, it will be easy for us to know if you are a bride. Or you just move to Johannesburg, you move to Cape Town, and you say, okay, this this is the trend, and then you implement and say, the Lord (laughs) said. You don't know what it means to be the bride. You don't know what it means to be the bride. I worked in the oil industry for 16 years in Nigeria. And I know my job well. I had enough money to buy a car every month and paid my salary. I can walk into the car shop and say, okay, I will go with Benz. And it will be so. I could pay my house rent with half of my salary every month. My annual house rent. I could pay it with half of my salary for one month. If you have ever been to Lagos, anyone been been to Lagos here? You've been to Lagos. You know the, the yellow buses of Lagos? Jehovah, the bridegroom, he told me, to use yellow, those yellow buses. Oh, you're not with me. Not for seven days, not for seven months, but for seven years. You know, the status car at some point in the office was BMW X5. That was when X5 was the thing. So if you want to show that you, are, you belong, you get your X5 and then you bring it to one of the operational meeting days and when we are done with the operational meeting, you buy a bottle of Coke for everybody. And then they will surround the car and say, oh. <laughs> Pour some Coke on, on, on you and say, yeah. <laughs> you've, 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 you've joined the, the, the club. You've joined the club. I never joined the club because the bridegroom said I should go by what? Yeah. If we check your life, and it doesn't look strange, then you are falling. You look just fine. You do the right things. Everybody likes you. You you are falling. Because, or you don't know, you don't know. Many of you grew up in Johannesburg. You have not even seen people that serve Satan diligently. Spirits, spirits, huh? necromancers, you have not seen them. The life that the spirit suggests that they should live in wretchedness, but, but they, 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 they like it because they are married to such spirits. And it's only through the devotions of those that commit to those spirits that those spirits can be known. The definition of what they do to people is what you see in the life of this man. Do you you understand that? That's what the apostles meant when they said we'll give ourselves to the ministry of the word of God and prayer. That means we'll be shaped. Our lives will be shaped. Our description, our orientation will come as a result of our irreconcilable commitment to the course of prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. You think... You think society will will like a man that is consumed by the Holy Ghost? He, no, you will be an offensive creature. Meanwhile, help me tell your neighbor, if you want everybody on the street to like you, then sell ice cream. Yeah, sell ice cream. And I suggest vanilla. I want to sleep in the night. Then he says, wake up. Somebody is lying in my name there. Respond to him. I said, they will hate me. Say, do, you have, do you have a reputation to protect? If you still have a reputation to protect, you are falling. Okay. 
You want to be nice, you want to preach nice, so that nobody will say he's offensive. Jesus will make you offensive. Jesus. You must note that only in Harlot is accepted every, every night. He falls in love every night. He, oh, there's a new one here. Only a harlot. But a bride sticks to the ideals of one. One. I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus. And I don't care how anybody in the world thinks about me. I, you know, when I, when I was doing yellow buses for seven years, they gave me names. They called me Jew. They called me until they, they ran out of names. But I was still, I was still okay. I was still good. Then after seven years, he said, okay. From now henceforth, you'll not need to buy a car again. I'll send you cars. I said, okay. Um, can you? Oh, you see? Some, some, someone is clapping that, that the Lord says he will give me cars. You see, you, see, you, you don't understand. The, the sense of my being is not derived by what I drive. If you have found security enough in God, you will know that there is nothing that can add to the sense of your being. Nothing. Nothing. You need someone to sing your praise, you are a baby. Wake up! Seven years of using the buses, they ran out of names. And when God released me from the body, he said, the reason why I put you through this is so that you will know that a man's life doesn't consist in the things, the abundance of things that he has. Now, I, I, and I say, God, couldn't you have taught me that in Bible study? <laughs> that is the only way he will get glory from my life. Amen. You see, it's about the groom. It's about his preference. It's not about you, it's about him. It's about what he wants. It's about what he wants to use your life for. He might even say, don't, don't stand behind the pulpit again and I'll be glorified. Amen. The bride will always align because the bride's description, the, 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 the bride's identity is drawn from the groom. How did you get your identity? You wanted to be the finest pastor in South Africa? That's how you got your identity, your style. Mm. That means people that are without the gospel in Limpopo will never hear your voice because you, you are in this um, showbiz kind of thing. Who do you serve? What's the name of your God? Number two. Babylon is called the great city. Great city. And so many technologies in it. It is a great city. But the new Jerusalem is called the holy city. You can have a great ministry. Mighty ministry. I was interviewing someone that just graduated from Bible school, and I said, okay, now that you finished uh, your training in Bible school, what's, your, what's the next thing for you? He says, I have contacted intercontinental ballistic missiles. <laughs> that can take two cities. See, see his, his idea of ministry is great. He, he doesn't have an idea of ministry that is tied to his loyalty to 
his Lord. Because what it means to be holy is that you are separated unto God. You have other uses, you are intelligent, you can have sex, you can do stuff, but you decide that you'll be governed by your Lord. Amen. That's why you look like this. Amen. That's why you function like this. Your generation might not even reckon with you because of the shape you now sustain, which is a product of your being separated unto God. I don't have time to open the scriptures to you today. If we go reading the book of Revelation chapter 21, you will find out that when the description of the new Jerusalem was laid out, the first thing that was identified in that city was the walls. Separation. Separation. That means you get to that point in your work with God where you have no use apart from the use that the Holy Spirit puts you to. I am separated unto him. Only him can operate me. Meanwhile, Satan has numerous assortments of softwares that can operate you if you care. One of them is called sin. Another one is self. Another one is Satan. Another one is the world. Are you there? I, I, I can go on and on listing softwares that Satan has developed to operate your life. Meanwhile, uh, Christ is supposed to be our life. That's the only software that should operate you. That's the administration under which you were put when you gave your life to Christ. And if God cannot exercise authority on your life, then God cannot accomplish his divine purpose through your life. If he cannot, then he cannot accomplish his divine purpose through your life. I hope you are not a great city. You have great ideas on how to do ministry. The type that will attract attention. So what you are doing is not according to any prescription anywhere. You are just what can work. What will catch. What will bust. And then you now develop a great city. And in that great city, you have different types of possibilities. Oh, there's no harmony. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But the new Jerusalem happens to be a holy city. If we take inventory of your life and we do not see an absolute devotion to God, we do not see God's government influencing your timings. Why you moved from Midrand to Pretoria. You can't, you can't, there's no encounter. You just saw that it seems the wave is moving to <laughs> Pretoria now. <laughs> In order for you to stay relevant, you had to Take that move when you discern the trend. Yes, sir. It means you don't have a God. That's what it means. Number three. Babylon is common. And I need to explain common. If I buy 10 pieces of this handkerchief, are you with me? Yeah. Then I decide to dedicate two of them to God. Are you there? Yeah. Under the old covenant, if such things that you dedicate to God are anointed, Sanctified by the anointing. I don't have time to tell you so many things. Sanctified by the anointing and kept in the house of God. They can only be used for purposes in the house of God. Now, the common ones are the ones you took home. You can use it to clean your shoe. You can use it to clean your table. 
You can use it to clean your glass. Those ones are common. It's the same thing, the same thing, but some are common and some are separated. It's just like, are you there? You are not there. There is a difference, for instance, between a sinner and a forgiving sinner. Are you with me? There is also a difference between a Christian and a consecrated Christian. God is... Have you, have you studied the book of Revelation? God was no longer looking for the congregation. Oh, you're not with me. In the book of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus was speaking about John the Baptist and Jesus said, he that has ears, let him hear. Then in the book of Revelation, the same Jesus now comes and when he was addressing the church, he says, he that has an ear, the same Jesus. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Do you realize that when Jesus came in the book of Revelation, he was not looking for the congregation, he was looking for he, the individual. Because, because he is wondering if he will still find faith in the earth. He's wondering if people will still believe in him enough to be foolish enough to separate to him. Sure. He's wondering, will he find such faith in the earth or will, will his house be infiltrated sure. by the kingdom of darkness? So he begins to look for the individual that still has an ear. To hear the counsel of God, not just for himself, but for the church. You are not with me. Do you have that ear? Because the last time you heard God clearly was the last time you obeyed him. Is obedience a big deal in your life? If it's not, you are falling. You are falling. Dr. Luke was the one that said in the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, the former treatise, have I made old Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And for a long time, I wanted to find out what he meant by to do because that was his executive summary of the book of Luke. All right? So I had to study the life of Jesus to find out what was his preoccupation. The doing that Luke was referring to in the book of Acts was operating under the government of God. Do you know what that means? Oh, Adam modeled the principle of rebellion and Jesus modeled the principle of obedience. So when he wakes up in the morning, because I don't have time, I would have shown you when Jesus wakes up. Then he goes, yes, uh, that pattern is in the Bible. Even Moses, and there were other people that used to. But that's not the reason for this teaching. So he wakes up a great while before day. That's what the Bible says. Then he goes into a solitary place to pray. Then he downloads what his father wants to do. Then the description of Jesus' day is that he does exactly what his father is doing. That means his father was his life. Jesus did not exercise the luxury of innovation or creativity. He did exactly what his father was doing. So Jesus became a theater for his father to display his preferences. Are you there? Jesus had 30 years of obedience as foundation for his teaching ministry for three years. One decade of obedience to one year of teaching. You, you have one year of teaching, one year of obedience to 10 years of teaching, and you want to take the world. One decade 
to one year. So just in case you want to have that, that kind of teaching ministry that Jesus had, I'm telling you the foundation of it. It's called obedience. Foolish obedience Amen. under the government of God. You are living to fulfill the preferences of another. And the same way the father was his life. That is how he is our life under the new covenant. And if you, if you want to summarize the Bible, if you get interested and you say, okay, I want to know what the Bible is about. The Bible is about Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. That's the summary of the New Testament. It is no longer I that live it. So your preferences are deleted. Your perspectives are out of the way. Your creativity is taken out so that the will of the one that tabernacles your heart can find expression. He influences your choices, your strategy, your style, your times, your seasons. Because it is expected that your life in the spirit will be a story that is telling from heaven. The same way there was harmony in the life of David. And we knew that the story that God was telling from the life of David was the compatibility between warfare and worship. What's your story? What's he telling through your vessel? You have not sustained a consistent walk in the spirit. You move in the flesh for, for three months, then you cry. <laughs> and you come back for five days and you're repenting. Repent. And you've committed adultery, you slept with that one, you follow this one away. Your wife is confused. She doesn't know if what you are running is it. What are you running? Then you repent and say, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> we don't know the story God is telling through your life because your life has not been consistent with God. We cannot tell what God is through your vessel, whether he is a psalmist or a minstrel, whether he is a prophet. We, we, we can't tell because you're, you, you live more in the flesh. You are more compatible with the flesh than you are in the spirit. You will avoid any form of government over your life whatsoever. So you are without spiritual description. You are common. When you stay with him consistently, we can tell that in you, he's a warrior. When you stay with him consistently, you will find out that one woman like this can challenge the philosophy of an entire continent, an entire nation. And, and people, unbelievers, will be forced to acknowledge you for what he has made you in the land. Are you common? Are you just there? Number four. So can we, can we try this now? Is it possible? This, this sound is wrong. You see? Find me. I, I'm, I'm in a location in the spirit. Use this sound to find me. If you get where I am, I will, I will, I will, I will tell you. Find me. Find me. Find me. Because we need to shift this meeting. You know? Without sound, I'm a teacher. But if he does that, I will enter into the prophetic office. The warrior church of Africa, a fearless crop of witnesses that will change the tide of philosophy, change the tide and cause darkness to move backward. 
Don't change it. Who? No, no. Who? Were you the one playing? Leave him. <laughs> Hi. You have made me. I have lost height. I, I was. Babylon is in the wilderness. And I hope you know a wilderness is not a desert. If you go to the wildernesses of Israel, you'll find vast lands that house rocks because of the way it is patched no one can dwell there life cannot survive in the wilderness and it happens to be that the only merchandise that we have as a people of God is the life of God If, if, if we walk into a place, a church, and we cannot sense the life of God, it's a wilderness. Where we get used to performance. We get used to our programs. It's supposed to be, there's prayer from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. There's, there's praise, praise worship from... And he can no longer interrupt that agenda to bring a unique expression of his will. We are in, we are camped in the wilderness. Because the wilderness cannot support life. Meanwhile, the new Jerusalem is on the mountain. It's in high places in the heavens. So he says, ye are come unto Mount Zion. Yeah. Unto the city of the living God. God dwells there. That's his city. There's a civilization there. There's a life that oozes out of that, that, that place. I cry to the church on the continent in Africa. It's time for us to migrate from the wilderness and each and every one of us must make it to the mountain top. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus appeared and a great multitude gathered unto him and instead of him to begin his normal crusades and to give out miracles, and signs and wonders, he decided to climb the mountain. The reason for which he, he, he climbed the mountain was because he wanted to unveil the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, which is what we call the Beatitudes theologically. Guess what? When he, he raised the standard and climbed the mountain, only his disciples made it up there. The true mountaintop people are very few in every generation. Don't deceive yourself. People that are willing to receive his constitution and to align their lives to his ideals. People that don't mind when he raises the standard, they are willing to pay the price to be on the same page with him. I left, I left the wilderness long time ago. Because in the wilderness, the only thing you see is man. A big man, a fine man, a rich man. But when you go to the mountain, everything is bigger than you. So you lose sight of you. And then when you successfully do that, you can now see how mighty he is. 
Let me stop here. This is the introduction of the message. Uh, we're supposed to look at some indicators, some pillars that show if you are building Babylon or you are building the New Jerusalem. Let it not be said that all of your life was deployed to build Babylon. And I don't have time to go to the book of Daniel to show you how that Babylon cannot raise people. Babylon cannot, cannot disciple people. So what Babylon does is that they look for gifted people, people with potentials, and then they bring them under their employment. So that your gift, your intelligence, your talent, your beauty will be used to adorn the glory of Babylon. I don't have time. I just want to stop here for, for tonight by bringing a little analysis. This is Esau and this is Isaac. Do they look alike? Why do you say so? So what's the difference between Esau and Isaac? They're children of Abraham. Esau happened to be his origin. You know, when God begins to probe, he doesn't look at face value. He probes deeper than that. For instance, in the book of uh, John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus shows up and Jesus says, ye are of your father the devil. Stay. Now, in Greek, the word of is ek. Huh? Ek is the same as in ekliaza. Ek. Ekliaza, called out of the world. Now, ek means source. Ek means origin. Ek means foundation. So when Jesus probes, he probes source. So where is the source? What is the source of Ishmael? It's the will of man. So the, at best, Ishmael will fulfill the will of man. That's what he has capacity for. Do you still remember Isaac? Isaac came when Abraham's body had died. Isaac came when Sarah was in menopause. The Sarah that was confirmed barren in her teenage age had entered into menopause. Isaac came because God visited and gave a promise. It is that promise that was coming to pass that gave life to where there was death. And in that life of resurrection, there was a possibility to bring forth seed. That was Isaac. He had the wiring to continue the legacy that Abraham had left. Because he was a child of promise. What are you building? How does it look like? Ishmael? Or Isaac. If we probe it, will we find the will of God behind it? Your style, your method. If we go beyond face value, it, looks, it all looks good at face value. If we go beyond face value, does it look like something that originated from the divine? That's where I want to leave you. If we come again, and the Lord allows, we'll go deeper. Then I will show you the story of Eden. Then I will show you seven things. If we do not get those seven things right, 
God will wipe all of us out and use, raise our children. We are going to pray. There's a hymn that we sang those days. I don't know if, I don't remember the wordings, but maybe you will help me. The chorus sounds like, and crown him Lord. Do you know this hymn? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate for Lift up the royal diadem and crown him. Because you could find an accommodation, put some seats together, you think that is church? <laughs> I, I don't think you've taken time to, to, to find out. And to know the God that we say we say. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What that scripture means is, number one, the gates of Hades will be in constant efforts to prevail against the church. Are you there? The only guarantee that the gates of Hades will not prevail is that we allow him to be the one doing the building. Yeah. Stay, stay. No, no, no. This is not a night to clap. We allow him to be the one doing the building. That means we Stay with him. He tells us, okay, this is what he wants to teach. Okay? Then we stay on that until he comes again and says, teach this now. And then you stay on that until he comes again and says, emphasize this now. Are you with me? And for your information, if he's not the one building, the gates of hell will prevail. Stay with me. And what you will have will not be the church. What you will have will be a synagogue of Satan. I don't have time. I don't have time. I, I just want you to think. People will come into that place and they will encounter things that will make them turn their backs on God forever. 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 The recovery will begin if God can lead all those wounded people that are products, victims of synagogues of Satan. If God can trust you to be the instrument he will use to begin the healing process that Africa must experience. Amen. If he can trust you, then you are part of the recovery. The recovery that God wants to begin to bring into place in this time. His Lord, His Lord, Amen. He has 
has risen from the dead he is Lord every knee shall bow every tongue that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Somebody sing to him now. He is Lord. He is One of the reasons why there's a major gap in our missionary manpower on the continent of Africa is because of such synagogues of Satan. So many people have been disappointed, wounded, all kinds of things. Many don't even believe there's any God out there. Can we pray today and say, Lord, can you make me one of the instruments of recovery? I, how I wish you, you would mean what you are praying when you begin to pray. I wish so. Can you make me one of the instruments of recovery? There's so many wounded. Our churches are filled with wounded people. Can you not see? There are people in this congregation right now, people, people present here right now that, that came here with, with wounds, all kinds of wounds, and it was not Satan that did that. They, they, they encountered such wounds in church. So there's no one willing to go all out for Jesus because of the example that has been seen in the church. And in most cases, the church becomes the distraction that turns people away from the Lord. Can you ask that the Lord will make you an instrument in this recovery? And when you pray, mean every word that you say so that we can secure his commitment tonight. Cry to him. Cry to him. Uh, 
Escove valaha selico beminale. E aí com pescute melia suke bras cafala mantalia. E cabero no santoria brama capa santa lecoria misa ze. Ai coveli mose cobre saquilo mahambala. Second prayer point. If you are a pastor here, a leader in church, a worker in church, and you were used as an instrument to bring injury to a member of the body of Christ, it would be a very wise thing for you to repent now before we do the next and final thing. So the window of, re of, 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 of repentance is, is open. Right? Make sure you secure it. We want to pray. Just in case you did not represent Christ in the life of that individual and for that reason that person now has turned his back on God. Make sure you secure mercy from God right now. Let us pray. Let us pray.
Jesus name the Lord said the only way first of all he says we are behind schedule as a church in South Africa we are behind schedule that's the first thing he said then the second thing he said if we are going to experience a fast track then the number of intercessors that are sold out will have to be replenished. So today we will not pray for miracles. I just want to pray for... It's not as if that anointing for miracles is not present, but that's not what God is doing. Right. And it took me a long time in my work with God to know that even though the anointing comes, it's a test of alignment for you to allow it and focus on what God wants. Maybe, maybe in the next conference, maybe he might want us to go into, and we'll gladly do so. And most of you will not go back with these reading glasses. But, but that's not what he wants to do now. Listen. He is going to anoint intercessors. He will anoint intercessors. First of all, the first set of intercessors will be 35, about 35 in number. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said tonight that you will begin to anoint intercessors. You said you will anoint intercessors. Oh my God. I ask that you stretch forth your hand to the left and to the right and to the back of the hall and to the overflow. Begin to anoint, 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 Holy Ghost. There's a fire, there's a fire I see in the spirit, and it's coming so heavy. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The flame of intercession, it comes upon you afresh. So that you can be set up to pray his prayers and not your prayers. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Now, if you, if you can, just be quiet. If you can. If you can, be quiet. Listen to me. I see seven cloven tongues of fire, seven of them. These seven cloven tongues of fire 
represent seven people in this hall. Now, us, who are the ushers? Ushers. Now, these seven people in this hall, there's a fire that will come on you. Now, ushers, when you find them, bring them. A fire will come on you at the count of seven. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Ushers. Listen, if you can. We have an emergency now. Listen. 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 Hallelujah. Listen, listen carefully. There's someone in this place. Your death has been concluded in the realm of witchcraft. Listen, listen to me. I say we have an emergency. In the next 21 seconds, the hand of God will come upon you and break that yoke of death from your life. You don't, wait. You don't even need to believe it. Don't worry. Father, in the name of Jesus, that one upon whom the spirit of death has been sent I ask that you stretch forth your hand, find that individual, locate that individual, locate that individual, locate that individual, locate, locate him. Now, when you ushers, ushers, bring those ones here. I need to cast out that spirit. Can I, can I touch that person, please? Yes, I break that yoke upon you. Come. In the name of Jesus. Come. I break that yoke upon you. I break that yoke. In the name of Jesus. that yoke in the name of Jesus I break that yoke in the name of Jesus come I break the yoke in the name of Jesus I break the yoke in the name of Jesus I break the yoke I break the yoke I break the yoke 
break the yoke. Yes. I break the yoke in the name of Jesus Christ. Now listen, before I run away. The Lord has given me permission to pray for the sick now. Jesus Christ. Now shake me. Put this hand here. Then pray. Pray in the spirit. tell you what he told me. The reason for which he said I should pray for the sick is not every sick person. Only people that have eye problems. And there is a reason. There is someone is going to heal. He will heal your physical eyes. Then when you come out, he will now make you a seer. And you don't need to believe what I just said. You don't need to believe. Okay? If you have any eye problem, short-sightedness, long-sighted, anything with the eye, you are eligible for what I'm talking about. So you can take away your glasses. Just put your hands on your eyes. Today is not a healing day. It's not a healing day. The reason why he wants to heal are you, is because he wants to raise a seer from this meeting. Put your hands on those. I just. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. It's your good will to raise a seer from among us. And you said you will heal the eyes. Then you will send the anointing. So I rebuke every blinding spirit. Blinding spirit be bound in the name of Jesus and come out of their eyes in Jesus' name. I command those eyes, eyes, see in the name of Jesus.
Remove your hands from the eyes. You have two minutes to conduct an investigation on your eyes. Two minutes. As you conduct this investigation on your eyes, and you notice there is a marked improvement that you cannot explain, come, come here. Then I will know who God is anointing so that I can instruct you on how to be faithful to the anointing he's going to give you tonight. So check your eyes for two minutes. If you notice there is a change because I see two people already healed and the number is increasing. If you notice that, you stand here. We'll sing that song twice. He is Lord. is happening and then I will pray then I will God through the anointing will show me who he wants to deposit this grace upon but confirm that they are healed first okay yes find out for me now can you give us some volume on this microphone please now you see wait 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 there are two angels that came here now listen these two angels that came here came with something like a lamp. And they've been moving around and I'm trying to find out what exactly is this lamp? And the Lord is speaking to me and he says that it's a, it's a revelational gift that will go into manifestation when you sleep. So that's number one. That's number two. Come, come, come. Yes, what happened there? Okay, I'm so I tried to draw the picture of the bed. I couldn't see what was on the screen. You couldn't see so what was on the screen. Was on the screen. So suddenly she can see what is there. Yes. Okay. I was so excited. Short sighted? For how long have you been using those glasses? More than twenty years. More than twenty years. And and what happened to you? I can I can see. You, you, you can see. Can we celebrate? Yes. yes. You see, you see.
I'm glowing. I like that aspect. <laughs> yes? You can see me clearly. Okay. Okay, one more. Did you did you did you test it? You, she can see. All right. All right. So he has opened your physical eyes. Now. You still have another miracle in line. You open your spiritual eyes. Now, let me give you some training. When you begin to see things in the realm of the spirit, 60% of the time is so that you can pray about them, not discuss them. Just keep quiet. Pray about them. Now, you see? Someone is already receiving the anointing of the seer, and the person is in the congregation. See, it's in the congregation. So, if you will let me, I'll just touch you a little, not so much, just a little. praying for, for this man, this red stuff came out of his eyes. Huh? Can you see? Where's the cameraman? Can you see what came out of his eyes? Red. Okay. Hold this. And this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give glory. Give glory. Give glory. Please don't move. Please don't move. Uh, we shouldn't rush to go under this anointing. Please, please. And don't try to go towards the man of God. Please, I urge you. We don't do that. We need to sow a seed to this life, to this ministry, before we leave. And I urge you that we do that now. This word that we have received is a corrective apostolic word. 
to the church in South Africa and the rest of Africa. This is a very critical word, and I want to urge you. I know maybe you came with different expectations, but let me tell you what we have received now is what the Holy 